Our watch was established to drive national change in the culture, behaviours and power imbalances that lead to violence against women and their children. And they evaluated the first stage of the strengthening hospital responses to um, family violence. And of course, hospitals are employers as well. And we've heard today as how as part of the service model, suggestions have been made about how hospitals can support their own staff. So Paddy Kinnersley from Our Watch is going to talk about the workplace as a setting for primary prevention. Thanks, Paddy. Thanks very much. Good afternoon. I've got the um, winning spot of the last one of the day, so I know you'll all be very excited to hear me speak because I'm last. Uh, I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and pay my respects to any elders past and present. I also think it's really important to acknowledge the work of decades and decades of uh, women's, women's health services, services like the CASAs, the sexual assault centres, who have kept this, uh, this matter on the agenda um, and not let it go when it wasn't politically cool to do so. Uh, and that is why we have come to this point in our history. And to, to have a room full of people like yourselves from health services to listen all day to what's been going on uh, in your own services around responding to violence against women is an absolute credit to you uh, and to the people who have worked so tirelessly for so long. Today, uh, I will just touch on my, uh, the work of our watch is a little different really to most of the work you've heard about today. We've really, our focus is on preventing violence against women and their children before it occurs. So it's on primary prevention. And so I'm just going to really skate across the top for two reasons. One is you're a bit tired. And two, because it's, um, it, it's a whole day of work of itself. So my aim is really just to have a touch point for you today and then you can um, do some more work or exploration of it yourself. And we'll finish off with a, a short, another short Our Watch clip that kind of nicely bookends the one that Sue Matthews started the day with. Um, that one's about sort of raising awareness and the one this afternoon, the one that we'll finish with, kind of condenses the work that we've done around primary prevention into an easily accessible um, clip. Both of those clips are available online for you to use in your own work. I'll also encourage you um, to look at your health services not only as an interface with the community, with women who are victims and your response, but also as really big employers uh, with a responsibility to looking after your own staff, but also as a really important part of the bigger picture to preventing violence against women over time. Right hand, there it is. So last year we released a framework for the prevention of violence against women called Change the Story. It's a shared framework developed by Anne Rose, Our Watch and Vic Health. And it really focuses on preventing violence before it occurs. And it looks at the whole population. So not on women as victims or as men as perpetrators, but on what everybody in this room across sectors and settings can do to change what's happening in our community around violence against women. It really focuses on a whole of population approach and focuses on what drives violence against women. What are the causes? Uh, because unfortunately, we are going to continue to hear incredible stories like Christine, and thank you again for sharing that with us today, uh, because we can keep responding and we have to keep responding and we have to keep doing that work, but we also have to do something to stop this from happening in the future. You'll all know as health services that you're not going to be able to deal with the increasing demand, whether it's violence against women or, or obesity or heart disease, etc. We all know the pressures that health services are under. In relation to violence against women, we have to take long-term action and the governments are doing that. The, the work in Victoria from, from this government is extraordinary. Uh, we are leading the country, um, but you all have a role to play in that as well. So change the story, uh, and honestly, I'm just going to skim across this, but change the story has made it increasingly clear that at a, at a social level, the key drivers of violence against women are gender inequality. Lots of you won't be surprised about that. Um, and the, the four elements of gender inequality that, that most consistently occur or need to be in place for violence to, to occur are these four. So... Any action that you take needs to address those four when we're talking about prevention. So you will, in the work that we've seen presented to you today, you'll be able to draw some lines to this work, to these four um, 
elements of gender inequality, although the work that you are doing is mainly in response. And that's absolutely necessary. But this is another element. This is the bigger picture element about how we're going to decrease violence against women over time. Any actions that you take as an organisation to prevent violence against women will need to address those four drivers. The reason that your organisations are so important is that we understand that in order to work across the whole community to address those four key drivers, we, that's not an individual matter. That's what can government do? What does local governments do? What do sporting organisations do? What are we doing in our schools about respectful relationships? And what are we doing in our organisations? We spend most of our life at work, and don't we love it? And so we need to make sure that those that work workplaces as a setting are providing gender equitable places for us to be. So as health services, yes, you have a responsibility as a huge organisation with an interface to the community, whether it's in small rural hospitals where you will hold a large amount of the employment, they become the lifeblood, one of the lifebloods of, of towns football clubs, local governments, health services. Um, and, or you're one of the big, big health services that have thousands upon thousands of workers who all have people that they connect with. So the knock-on effect to your 5,000 staff could be 15,000. So what you do in your workplaces is really important. So that's the inward looking. A lot of what we've heard about today is necessarily outward looking, although there's lots of work in your systems, but inward looking to your staff. Uh, you also, I think, have a leadership responsibility. Lots of government dollars, lots of smart people. Everyone in this room is smart, or you all have leadership roles, one way or another, and you can drive change in our community and our community attitudes. I'm not going to go through each of these slides, but as work, health services, as, as workplaces, as settings, are really important because actually people expect you to show leadership. There's actually a lot going on in, the, in our workplaces, in health services. I'm on, a, I'm on the board of a health service. I'm really aware of some of the issues that are going on in health services around bullying and harassment. Uh, and so we actually have a responsibility to take action for our own people as well as for the community. on behalf of the government, as governors and stewards of your organisations with public dollars, we absolutely have to do something about the cost of violence against women. Most people in this room are not going to come to this issue because of the cost, but it is an impact, and it is an impact that we can do something about. And finally, the bit that I get excited about, as somebody who's passionate about primary prevention, is that you as a workplace you have a huge opportunity to lead the type of cultural change that's required to prevent violence against women before it occurs. Big workforce, huge reach into the community, big leadership roles. Of course, any work you undertake with your own workforce and as community leaders will promote a stronger and more engaged workforce. You know that means more efficiency and that's, that's excellent. But what really excites me is about your ability to contribute to the broader work where every sector and every setting is chipping away at reducing the gender inequality that brings us to violence against women. I'm not going to expect you to take this in at the end of the day, but um, today there's been quite a bit of talk about whole of organisation response to whole of organisation response to family violence, and they, that's absolutely correct. And you're talking about how you work to respond to family violence through every element of your system, through data, through your interface with women, all of that sort of stuff. When you're talking about your workplace as a setting for change, you also need to look at whole of workplace setting. So in here, in, in that um, bottom right-hand corner, the in some ways, a lot of the work that we've talked about today sits in those two spheres. Not, not completely and not cleanly, that does cross over, but the notion of how what are you doing in your own workplaces to ensure you've got gender equality? What are you doing about bullying harassment in your workplaces? How are you making sure your governance structures support gender equality? So there's another whole piece of work, and I know that you have a lot going on in your health services. There are so many, you have so many requirements uh, and so much accreditation and all paperwork and all of that sort of stuff. This, this work actually needs to infuse through everything you do 
because it will provide you with a better workplace. So I've been speeding through because I really want to um, finish with the, the clip. Um, and as I said, I acknowledge that I've just really dipped our toe into the water into the uh, primary prevention setting. And I would encourage you to um, jump onto our web, the Our Watch website to access a deeper understanding about Change the Story, the national framework. And that framework can be used by you as organisations to help you move forward through this process. So if we could go to the clip. Thank you. This is the story of a boy and a girl. It's a universal story and an Australian story. It's a story that occurs every two minutes, in fact. A story that happens 657 times a day, every day of the year, and in every kind of household and every city and region across Australia. This is the biggest story behind violence against women. This story doesn't have a happy ending. Because this is the story of how gender inequality contributes to the murder of one Australian woman almost every week. Sounds like a tall tale, right? Let's take things back to the start. Here's the story of a regular woman. As a girl, she gets told how pretty she is, never how clever she is, that if she wears a short dress, she's asking for it, that proper girls don't play football, and there's no girls footy team at school anyway. She grows up and gets used to being harassed by men on the street. That's just the way it is. Here's the story of a regular man. As a boy, he learns that women aren't equal to men from a very early age. Even though both his parents work, on the weekends, his mum does the housework while dad watches sport. When he cries about being bullied at school, his dad tells him to stop being such a girl and just punch him right back. Technically speaking, we'd say that these social norms, practices and structures have shaped both the boy and the girl, creating a society where women are valued less and men are expected to be dominant and in control. In such a world, disrespect and hostility is excused and violence against women is far more likely. But back to our story. The girl grows up into a woman, the boy grows into a man, and they begin to date. He jokes that he hopes she doesn't get fat now that we're together. She's not sure whether she should laugh. They have the same education and do similar work, yet he earns more money. He's quickly promoted, like other men in the company, while she gets overlooked. At home, she does all the household chores, and he takes control of their joint finances seeing as he's the main breadwinner and all. When they're at the pub, he puts her down in front of his mates. His friends stay quiet. In the morning, he wakes up and blames the alcohol. And stress, he always has an excuse. When she gets pregnant, her boss says she can't come back part-time. After the baby is born, the lack of flexible job opportunities and childcare keeps her out of the workforce. She is socially isolated and financially dependent on him. He controls decision-making and her. They are not equals. She is dependent on him for everything. So she never tells anyone that he has started to hit her. She doesn't say anything to her family or friends. She grows more isolated. She has nothing else but him. So she lives with the violence until their story ends, one way or another. This story isn't a one-off. It's a story shared by one in four Australian women who have experienced physical or sexual violence from a current or former partner. And it's a story of one in five women since the age of 15 who experience sexual violence, including rape, one in four emotional violence, and one in three women physical violence. But it's also a story that affects children. More than half of the women who experienced violence had children in their care when the violence occurred. For victims and perpetrators, violence against women is the conclusion often reached after a life lived in a society where women and men aren't treated equally. But we, you and I, can change the narrative. Better education, policies, practices, support and funding can prevent this all too common story. When women and men have equal power, value and opportunities in relationships and in society, violence against women is less likely. By nurturing caring, respectful and equal relationships, and by creating equitable and inclusive communities, workplaces and institutions, we can create a society of equality and respect where violence against women is unthinkable. Let's change the story. Because ending violence against women 
starts with gender equality. Uh, so that's all from me. And with my 28 seconds available, I'd just really like to thank um, Michelle for her work on this project. We were involved in the first um, part of the project and to a smaller extent in the second part of the project. And to bring uh, a group together like this to provide the speakers today and the, moment, the continuing momentum, um, just congratulations to you, Michelle. I think you've done an extraordinary job. Thank you.